the beach I played on as a child and have not visited in many years. I am on holiday in my homeland, a homeland from which I have been a voluntary exile. Tomorrow I leave. My name is Celia. I was born on this north coast of New South Wales. My forefathers were early pioneers of European stock. There is something quite potent about the birth of white Australia. I see it as a caesarean birth in which the embryo of crime, guilt and suffering was torn out and placed in the lap of the new mother, Terra Australis, incognito. The pain of the convict's existence, the deprivations faced by the early explorers and first settlers, the loneliness of the empty landscape, the failure in relationship to the Aborigines, and the violence of the untamed natural forces are realities that were present at my conception. But for now, I am a dreamer, caught between living in this present and being lost in imagination. An orange tubular lily, the thud of a frangipani blossom, falling silently to earth. The heaviness in the air before a storm, the piercing rain, the persistent croak of frogs. These are the summer elements. tentatively on either side of the deep Clarence River that curved itself in a wide gesture at the centre of the small provincial town. Once an hydraulic ferry had been the link between the north and south banks, carrying cattle, horses, carts, people and produce, over and back, over and back. The ferry was now replaced by a double-spanned road and railway bridge. It had a section that could lift to allow the steamers access to the wharves upstream. Every month, the steamers brought supplies to this and other northern towns from the capital, Sydney. Boats called at the wharves to collect timber from the mills. Hardwoods were cut down from the scrub and taken to Sydney to be distributed. I lived just around the corner from where the old ferry once birthed. The church was up the road. We lived in a yellow and white weatherboard house with a corrugated iron roof. Like most houses in the street, it had wide verandas. We had a pretty and tidy front garden, but the back was more wild and wonderful. Jacaranda trees grew in the garden. The broad streets had been planted in the early days of the settlement with camphor laurels, Morton Bay figs, weeping figs and plane trees. Our town was famous for its trees and especially its jacarandas. Bougainvillea vines grew everywhere with oleander, poinsettia and laburnum. Our house was within walking distance of the main street where our friends and relations owned businesses. Bananas grew on the steep slope several miles south of Grafton 
and sugar cane and dairy farms were dotted along the rich alluvial river flats. Along the river bank, clumps of water hyacinths grew in thick colonies. Patches of clean, soft sand could be found by those who knew where to look. Oysters grew in clusters on the rocks at Yamba where the river entered the sea. Fresh water fishing on the river and deep sea fishing far out from Yamba gave some occupation in and out of wartime. Pelicans lived on the river. A huge sugar factory rested on one island and on other islands communities associated with the farms worked long, hard hours. The river rose and fell gently according to the tide, but as well as this it was subject to dramatic and sudden flooding, awesome and regular. This added to the fertility of the low-lying land. It also caused terror in the hearts of the town dwellers, since each flood, as well as following a particular pattern, was inclined to have original twist, either bursting a bank at a hitherto secure spot, or rising to a new high water mark, bringing rushing water into streets and houses once considered safe. When such a flood was in full spate, the river would be carrying in its strange new currents items from people's homes drowning cows bellowing, pieces of abandoned wood, and other evidence of chaos and of human loss. As children, we delighted with the drama. through the foothills of the Great Dividing Range. Into this, a narrow river flowed briskly, the Nimboida, over clean rocks and pebbles, alongside a clearing in an otherwise heavily wooded terrain. Within the clearing was a small human habitation. Four separate houses provided basic shelter for the manager at the sawmill and the families of his workmates. A creek trickled along one boundary of the clearing. Green moss grew along its banks. Maiden hair fern clung with roots that went deep into the moisture of the silent and shaded bank. Platypus swam and burrowed in the sheltered stream. Beyond this, a red dirt track passed from west to east. It was the link between the eastern tablelands of the Great Divide and the coastal town of Grafton, a distance of 112 miles. The road followed the tracks made by bullock teams earlier in the century. Across the river at this point was a strong plain wooden bridge built to carry the timber lorries into the rainforest. The track rose steeply. It curved and twisted through the gullies, through the gums, the ferns, the shadows, and the echoing call of the invisible bellbirds. Here the bushmen felled the trees, the bulldozers pushed, the lorries waited, were loaded, and then groaned their way down the dangerous track. A turn-off took them to the mill. To the east, the road continued its rise and fall, but more gently as it eased its way to the coast via Grafton to Yamba. Along this track, a mile from the mill, 
lived a policeman and his family in a small, low timber house with a corrugated iron roof and an outside dummy. There was no fence. Chickens ran around the rocky landscape and scratched for food. They made soft patches of earth where possible. They squatted and clucked, puffed and wriggled as they pushed the dust through their feathers to clean themselves. At noon in summer, they sat silently, shaded under the tank stand at the back of the house until the heat had passed. In winter, they scratched less. They sheltered inside their coop away from the prevailing winds and cold, biting rains. Each evening, the coop was locked. Dingoes howled in the dark distance. Further along the road to Grafton, almost hidden in a gorge, was the Nimboida Hydroelectric Power Station. Its dam braced the river. Dark pipes, like prehistoric reptiles, thrust themselves through the landscape. Channel dust, the water turned the turbines. From this energy, electricity was generated. you find your way across the barrier of drought, fire, geology, latitude. Fire-scarred sweetness puffed out from scraggy bark and leathery, feathery, scratchy leaves. Your hue is gold, pale lemon or simply white, the colour of light. You take the sun into your sap and the nugget of the ancient soil you alchemize. The blood of the convict, the aborigine, the free settler, the explorer, in silence persistently explode, shattering puffballs of light invisible. In the shimmer of the sun at midday, Warmth to warmth to recapitulate the millennia of habitation isolation with childlike surprise drawing me to bend, to reach, to tug, to look, to wonder. Secret stir and shadows of clouds. 
clouds ripple on the drained gold barley stalks sodden and rotting. A black crow sits and calls as to echo another replies. A collared dove dips to the bird bath. The pale straw is now more radiant as the sun comes. It's a good day for burning leaves. The wind is blowing gently from the south and brings smoke to my nostrils. The wind has gone and will return. The wind comes from nowhere, unasked and somewhat seasonal, rattling at my windows and banging doors. According to its whim, it seems it comes, but according to itself, it follows laws, scattering twigs from the sycamore into the rose. Rose hips in clusters fall and leaves brown and curled, the green cling with tenacity. It is the triumph of the unexpectedness of everything. You yowl and bang and groan and bluster. And wind, you are pure spirit. There is nothing of your substance I can grasp or touch. You move the heavy cargo across the ocean or assist the transatlantic jumbo in her crossing. Many times I've made that journey, with an hour less en route with the help of a tailwind. I am comforted by the wind blowing. It suggests change and rain by the way the dark clouds are rolling in from the sea. The hard crackle of leaf tears across the pavement, one, then another. Others have been raked and burned this morning, and the fresh smoke lingers in my nostrils and in this room. The birds are restless. The air is full of their twitterings. Now and again a crow calls above them. His sleek, heavy blackness flies off from the telephone pole to its alternative. The turn is towards autumn. The stalk of a poppy is brown and stiff and withered. It sprinkles fine black seed to earth at the end of summer. Its blood radiance has gone. Petals fallen, folded limp, without sustenance, without attraction to call and cup and hold, the bee, the butterfly, or curious insect. Rain, mist, and dew fall on the process of decay. Each season has its limit to radiance, perfection, excellence. The constant is change, to re-become again, yet never. It is this autumn mood I work within myself. As the seasons come and go, I'm continually surprised as to how new nature is when I meet her again in her next cycle. Yesterday I smelt leaves burning, the tang so familiar, grey smoke curling in a spiral with its tumble and fall, wind tossed, like play, always new, always familiar, and joyous in its unexpectedness. Could the dying be the same? That I enter her sacred chamber with a childlike trust and joy, 
confident in her gift of the old pattern returning, as if for the first time. It is autumn now, as if it's always autumn, always now. Nature holds her breath. Warmth must cool to be rekindled. There is a melancholy associated with this time of year. The sun, brilliant in its setting, is a long way off skirting across the sky, peeping, hiding, leaving, leading me to myself. A closing in of light, ink-washed sky, naked trees, and a cold sea air bringing a chill hint of change. <laughs> Daylight, crisp, moist, sunny air, keen on the skin, waking me across my cheek as I stride the back path with its crisscross of lime indented. Early morning, yet the sun is high, burning through the white boil kitchen curtain, white light on white. A shiny pheasant stalks the hairy grass. White daisies open as the house shadow withdraws. A collared dove flaps and sips cool water. Points of copper beech hedge wave from firmly held new stalks. Just here and there, the crunch curl of drained brown leaves, reluctant to fall, until all sap withdraws, which the wash of green hedge will ultimately demand by high summer. The barley is waving in smoke gray billows as light and shade play across its lengthening shoots. Hen pheasants strut, a shiny black crow cruises, the herring gull sits on the chimney stack looking towards an island in the Firth of Forth, Fidra. Her cry welcomes the day in May. <laughs> summer and tarnish of gold, wrinkle of tanned skin, freckled pointillism, sand falling out of sandals, first crimson leaf hiding in the Virginia creeper. Evening closing in by a few minutes enough to cause alarm, demand an adjustment. Festival tents appearing and festival flags, early leftovers from the new Scottish Parliament, a bill to ban fox hunting being debated in Westminster, John F. Kennedy Jr. gone to an early grave, airports crowded, lost property at Waverley Station escalating. Crowds of foreign students waiting at the number 11 bus stop. Hanging flower baskets abundant. 
triumphant in their signature. Fold of midsummer, I'm holding you as your lady in waiting. The Bar Mitzvah Boy. <laughs> It was David Jacob's reading at Joshua's Bar Mitzvah. Our God and the God of our fathers, he said. We had come from North and South and Transatlantic, of mixed persuasion, resembling the various phases of Joshua's life and the areas of commitment of his parents. We were the Scottish contingent two Gentiles and one Jew. We joined the congregation of the Reform Synagogue, the Tree of Life on Fallow Court Road. Recognising old friends, we took our place. A layman led the prayers, guiding us gently through the unfamiliar text, backwards to forwards. Wrapped in prayer shawls, dotted with yamel keys, or simply clad, the congregation stood and sat accordingly. The bar mitzvah boy glowed. He was the reason we were there, to acknowledge his crossing into adulthood with its perils and possibilities. A passage entitled our God and God of our fathers was read, I said. The God of our fathers I inherit. My God is the one I make. I reject the God of the fathers, investigate him with all my strength to find my own. The mother of the Bar Mitzvah boy stood at the tabernacle with her youngest son, her daughter, and the bar mitzvah boy. Her husband stood with them as father, as rabbi of the congregation, of the reform synagogue, the tree of life on Fallow Court Road. <laughs> boy, the mother's sister-in-law from Canada, sat with her children and husband, who was the brother of the mother of the Bar Mitzvah boy. The grandfather of the Bar Mitzvah boy sat with the cousins and the aunt and the uncle from Canada. His wife, his second wife, was at his side. She was not the grandmother of the Bar Mitzvah boy. The real grandmother of the Bar Mitzvah boy on the mother's side was dead. The mother of the mother of the Bar Mitzvah boy was dead. She died at 57, they said. For many years they had fled from Poland eastwards from one camp to the next. The mother of the Bar Mitzvah boy was born on that journey to take her place within a family in exile on the run, victims escaping the predator. 
now the mother of the mother of the bar mitzvah boy is dead. Nonsense. Ga, 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 gimme gripes, nig, rig, nits, not nice. Nightmare stare, hollow air, stay there, don't come too near. I fear. There lived an old man with three sons and five daughters who all became nuns. A magpie, a candlestick, a hay fork and bramble pick and tumpety tumpety tum. There was an old woman of brine who said to herself, I must rhyme to keep myself happy so as not to get snappy and stay calm as the clock that doth chime. Hither and thither and yon, lived in a hut by the pond, where fish they did jump, and skunk they did slink, and Doddery fumbled along. Now Doddery fumbled along, toothless, and singing his song. It was quite a ditty, and air so, so pretty. He cheered himself all the day long. children everywhere. I am the spirit of time and I speak in rhyme of the Christmas season and adventide and mysteries stretching far and wide. Now what is a mystery, I hear you say? Well, a mystery is, come what may, a tiny mouse in a little hole, scratching his whiskers all alone. Where does he come from? Where might he go? A mystery mysterious unless somebody knows. Or a pussycat curled high in the fork of a tree, caring nothing for you or nothing for me, just purring there as he dreams away of mice in holes, of children at play, or nice warm sauces of full fat milk, a roaring fire, a fish-filled brook, from which his dainty claw might spear a tasty morsel. <coughs> oh my dear, I didn't really mean to eat you fish. It's just that you're such a tasty dish. Yes, fish, mouse, cat, they're all, I would say, mysteries mystified in their own special way. So, you know what mystery is, we've settled all that. What else can I tell you from my endless vat of comings and goings and thises and thats? A favourite word, thistle, no. Tangerine, no. What about cackle? There's Cackle McPherson and Cackle McGee and Cackle the Fishmonger 123 and Cackle Much Faster and Cackle Slow Down and Cackle and Cockle and Tumble Me Down. There's Tatalance Cackle and Cackle Trulu and Japanese Cackle and Chinese too and faster, much faster, as fast as you can and slower and slower my cat you cackle. So, run. Oh dear, I think the spirit of time, which is me, is showing his age, though timeless he be. Now, what is 
timeless. Did I hear someone say, come, listen, I'll tell you, but it's a secret just for you. is timeless, where tired is no more, where yawning and crying are under the floor, where gossamer hangs and sunlight is tall, and jasmine and friendship eternally call to the robin's red breast and the peacock's blue tail, to feather and fathom and prettily play beyond dreams and wonders, beyond stars and moon, beyond tears and snowdrops, beyond whistles and spoons. Timeless forgets to remember what is before it might happen unless it begins, and so time is less and less is time, floating and fleeting and billowing blown, sea spray and rainbow and crystals so clear, a place made of paradise, not one single tear, not one single tear. Is there indeed such a place? Yes, there is, my dear pilgrims, I'll tell you, post haste. It's our home where we've come from, our home that we know will one day be ours when the long day is done like summer and autumn and winter and spring. A paradise perfect in each leaf and twig. A perfect in paradise, where can that be? I think you might know. It's between you and me, and thee and me, and thee and thee and thee. Tee hee, tee hee, tee hee. The first section of a question must dawn at a very early age. I have my first childhood memory, but I cannot recall my first question. It must have been, what is that? Where would the chubby little finger have pointed? is my name. I'm Poppy, myself, exclusive. I'm quite fond of myself, I must admit, and seek joy. Oh yes, and find it often. Not as a toy or plaything, but substance yielding. Shielding from the hot burn of tossed loss. Laughter might follow loss in time, but if too soon is cruel. I don't know if I have the courage yet to say or ever say the gift of loss, more the tilt of it, the echo absence of it. O oh, loss that will not let me go. Oh yes, Poppy is my name.
Purple Lady. I am the Purple Lady from last Saturday and all Saturdays from before and beyond. The Purple Lady from violent buzzing and buzzing of those flies that sting like the nettles of the bees, if you please, trapped under my petticoat, up to my knees. I am a pale-skinned, delicate lady, purple from indignity of creatures wild. Hark, here comes relief, be quick, be brief. Great is my need, impatient am I in my greed to be soothed and made anew. I sense rescue, speak, my deliverer. Frozen pink, ink, lace pink, turkey throat pink, of pastel umbrella, twirl, swirl, swallow the scent of lilac falling, crumble of stone, tumbling taut, marshmallow pink thought, languid stare into crystal air, umbrella held high. Elastic stretches. <laughs> Elastic stretches. Frogs, a rusty croak. Snails, silver trail. Wings, feathers, hair, wool. Slanting, slippery snowflake. Where is God for you? Mm -hmm. 